All right, we good? Super glad you're here. Proud of you for being here. We've got a lot of ground we're going to cover tonight, so let's pray, and we'll see what God does. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of another day. And Father, I just thank you for each and every student and leader who took the time to be here tonight. They have very busy schedules, and I'm thankful that they made the investment to be here. And I pray that um, when they leave this place, they feel better equipped to live the life that you want them to live, you designed them to live, so that they can glorify your name in all that they say, all that they do, and all that they pursue. Father, give me strength to um, communicate your word in a way that is encouraging and equipping. And I pray that you would lovingly uh, nudge us in the direction of areas that maybe we're doing well, but also some areas where we could do some real improvement uh, to make our lives healthier and more mature. So Father, help me to be an uh, instrument of your peace, and may we come away from our time excited to persevere in the priorities that you lay before us. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. All right, so if you look at your notes real quick, um, you're going to see the front page relates to highlights from this book that we're going through on Make Today Count, all right? And um, I'm just going to remind you, if you don't have the book, um, the book normally costs 10 bucks, but the church is graciously allowing you to buy it for five. So it's in our bookstore and where you can get the snacks, you can get them in the cafe on a Wednesday night. The reason we're doing this series is for this very reason. We're going through a very unusual time in history, and it can get overwhelming for the ability that you can't plan ahead. It's very difficult to plan ahead right now. But what you can do is be intentional about praying and asking God to help you how to make today count. Because if you make today count, you don't have to worry about tomorrow as much because he's going to prepare you for today in a way that will make you win in tomorrow. And so if there's an area of life that has of great significance, it's this area tonight. We're going to talk about a lot of things in this book, but this particular chapter on priorities is a game changer, all right? And here's how I know. The older you get, the more you will clearly see who lives priorities and who doesn't. There's a presence to people who have a plan and a purpose for their life, and there's a, pl there's a presence to people who have no clue. It is discernible. I can walk into a room of people and pretty consistently, not even knowing them very well, just watching their actions for a little while, you can get a pretty good read on whether they're very intentional on living their priorities or they live a very passive and almost like, well, it'll all work out kind of life. And it doesn't if you don't have a plan. And so we're going to walk through some of the things that relate to that. And so not in your notes, there's kind of these two ideas. There's a, what I would call target priorities and time priorities. The two of them are different. There's two types of priorities, okay? This, again, is not in your notes. Some of the stuff I'm just going to tell you, and if you write it down, good for you. If you don't, good luck to you. Um, but hopefully, you have an interest in being successful. I do youth ministry because I love you, and I want you to be successful. And success has a strategy. You ask any great athlete, any great mathematician, anybody who's great at anything, music, pick your topic, there were people who had a plan and they prioritized their time and they, de they demonstrated it by having a plan specifically that I'm going to walk you through that I've been doing for decades, okay? So if you actually apply the stuff we're going to go through tonight, I really am excited for you. If you don't want to do it, I hurt for you because I know what's going to happen if you don't live it because it's discernible as you get older and I'll watch. So there's two types of priorities. There's target priorities, which really are like, who do you want to be? That's what a target. Do you have a sense of, I want to be that. I want to be that kind of person in my spiritual walk. I want to be that kind of person when I handle finances. I want to be that kind of person in my physical fitness. Or I want to be that kind of person. You have to have a target, okay? So the target priorities are one. The time priorities are how am I going to do that? What am I going to do with my time so that that target actually becomes a reality? And if you know anything about target practice or you know anything about focus, guess what you have to be? Focused. You can't be random when you shoot at something. You can't be random if you're going to play or do something specific because you're not going to have the results you want. So what I'm going to ask you to do as I talk through some of this stuff tonight is to think through the areas of how would I describe the key priorities target-wise in my life? Can you articulate them right now? If someone said to you, could you give me your top pri five priorities, like targets that you're aiming for, do you have an answer? Because you need to have an answer. 
If you don't have an answer, hopefully you'll be working on an answer by the end of tonight. And by having an answer, it's going to impact, now that you have a target, it's going to impact how you use time. Because time is a currency. It's a currency you can waste, or it's a currency that you can leverage. Wisdom will show what you do with it. And so as you go through some of this stuff, you're going to see all kinds of ideas as it relates to um, what he talks about in the front part of your notes. I'm just going to highlight a couple of key things before we get to the practical side on the back. Um, stuff that I want to teach you that's separate from the book. But you'll see under the Pareto principle, he talks about in this book that if you give 80% of your effort into things that are your peak things, your target things, you're going to get a huge return. Okay, but what people tend to do is they do secondary things or third level priority things and the number one things get neglected consistently. And after a while, that will play out in a negative way. So we're going to talk about some of these things. And as you see under the headlines of the chapter, he says, take back today, ask yourself three questions, stay in the strength zone. And all of these key things will basically help you and I live a life that will be living priorities. Okay, so when we went through the PowerPoint and we did stuff in the last show, we talked about attitudes important. We talked about all of this from Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about such things. And it goes on in the verse, if you do that, the God of peace will be with you. What you think about matters. And one of the greatest things that I used to see when I coached competitively against um, some pretty high level teams, because when you're playing as a state champion, you're playing other state champions. And the first way I knew we were going to win is when I knew their attitude changed. When my opponent's attitude went into defeatism and critical spirits of one another, I knew it was only a matter of time before we were going to win the game. Because your attitude matters, okay? We joked about Lucy from the Peanuts Christmas cartoon. I uh, went to McDonald's and ordered a Happy Meal. Still uh, didn't work. I'm still grumpy. You're going to see people in your life that are going to have a commitment to being grumpy. Here's my advice to you. Avoid them. They're not worth your energy. They're going to suck you into the vortex of their negativity, and you're going to become negative and critical, and you're going to wonder why you feel so bitter about life. Try to be the person that is doing what the Bible says and to be focusing on what's true, noble, right, all of these things so that you can be a joy to people and not a frustration. He talks about going into your strength zone. Again, you need to look at that on your own time. And he talks about how do you develop your strength zone. This is the area that I think you really need to read this part of the chapter if you didn't read it. Because he explains how he's done that. One of which he does trial and error. You try something that someone says you're good at and see if you love doing it. And if you're good at it and have good counsel from people who say to you, yes, you can sing. No, you cannot sing. Okay. So there's this idea that you need truth tellers who will tell you what you're good at and what you're not. And in the process through trial and error, you're going to start to see where God gave you the gift of starting at a higher square than other people. Just because of the way he made you. Some of you can look at math in your minds that I could never dream of doing. Some of you can do things athletically that I couldn't do, whatever it might be. But for me, you put me in front of any particular court or field with a ball, I generally can handle my own. I don't know why, but it's the way God made me, okay? I can do it in my mind somehow. I can't do math on paper, but I can do math in space. I know how to throw a ball to get to a target. I know how to kick a ball to get it to a target. That's a strength zone. Okay? You learn it through trial and error. You go through the council, as he says. You go through personality tests. We'll talk about a fall retreat. And personal experiences of what makes you feel alive. Okay? So part of understanding what gives you priorities is helping you understand what makes you feel more alive. Okay? And so he talks about these different things um, in that, that three questions. He's like, what is required of me? What gives me the greatest return? And what gives me the greatest reward? You have to do the time and the work to figure that out, okay? So what I learned, just as a practical example, when I played soccer, I am clearly not very tall to head the ball, okay? I was terrible at it. And so for years, I would sit here and I would go and crash on like a corner kick to try to head the ball on the goal. It was the dumbest thing in the world for me to do. Until finally, I did exactly what I'm trying to preach and teach to you. I took a step back and realized this is not my strength zone. But for some reason through training, if the ball ever bounced out in the, in the goal area, for some reason, because I trained, I could pick a corner and hit it consistently. And it's one of the reasons God blessed me to score a lot of goals. 
okay? When I acknowledged I wasn't good in this area, it wasn't going to bring a good rate of return to my team, I made an adjustment, and that adjustment changed my experience, my records, and also the team's record. So you have to do an honest evaluation of what you're good at, that other people affirm for your strength zone, but also do the honest work, I'm not good at this. Don't be embarrassed by it, just move on, okay? It's a huge part of understanding your priorities. As you get to the bottom of the page, before we get to some other stuff, you need to evaluate your priorities daily. They change with the seasons of your life. You have some priorities right now. Your primary priority is education. If you want to have a good job and you want to be able to lead people, here's a good idea. Leaders read. You'll find across the board, leaders who are leading people are readers. They're always learning, always growing. You know who's not being in leadership? People who say, I don't want to read, I don't want to learn. You're going to be told what to do most of your life. Okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. It's, it's a fact. Okay? But if you have the courage to live out the priorities of recognizing God's gifted me in this, and I want to get better at this, I'm going to read some books on these areas. Okay? So as you do that, you're going to have to evaluate how your priorities change, and it will impact how you handle time. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. When you delegate things, he talks about that. It's important. And invest in the right people. Okay? You can look at that on your own time. Here's a quick part. Go to the second part of your handout on the back. <coughs> When you and I see these different things that, that are going on in the world today, I want you and I to recognize that at the core, you are responsible for you. So in as much as you're here tonight, I'm proud of you for being here. I pray that you have the courage to go home, look at the notes that we talked about, that there's two types of priorities. There's the target priorities that are listing kind of who you want to be. And then you have the time priorities of how you're going to use your time to figure out what I should do to get there, okay? And it's critical that you understand that. But here's the number one priority. I've said this a million times, and I'll say it till the day the Lord takes me home. There's three questions that matter. The I am question, the I do question, and I invest question. If you get these three questions right, you will have a wealthy life, okay? The I am question is the number one question of life. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? All of life hinges off of your answer. He's either your, your savior and your Lord because you understand he died for your sins so to set you free. That's the biggest question. So your faith is number one in terms of priority. You have a decision to make. Number two is who you will say I do to in marriage. That decision will impact decades of your life. So who you are in character and who they are in character matter. So that choice and prioritizing your life is important and who you're going to have the privilege to get married to. And the third question relates to what will you invest your time in? Will you have the blessing of doing a calling, something you're good at, and you happen to get paid at it? Or are you going to spend your life doing a job that you basically don't like, but it pays the bills? If you do the work on stuff that you love and do the work that God wants you to do to prioritize your life, here's what I'll tell you. You get those three questions right, you're going to hit a stride in your life that people are going to see there walks a guy, there walks a girl who actually lives with priority that is wise. You're going to have a presence to your life because you know what you're going to do. Okay? doesn't mean you have the answers for everything, but you're going to know what you're going to do and why you're going to do it, which is why this verse is so critical. Jesus summarizes the entire Bible in two lines, essentially, or four lines. When you get right down to it, he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He's asked a question. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these. So in as much as we put God first and then have him teach us how to love the people he put in front of us, we're going to increase in wisdom and in the priorities that God says, that's what really matters. That's what really matters. And as you understand that, this next verse makes a little more sense as well. Ephesians 5, 15 through 18 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil, okay? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. <coughs> Excuse me. And the next one is intentional, verse 18, because some of you are in this chapter and this chapter will only increase as you go off to college, okay? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, there's a presence to someone who lives in, in God's will and his priorities that supersedes their peers' approval. 
I can't tell you how many times I got teased when I was in high school and college for not drinking and getting out, going out and sleeping with girls and doing stuff that I shouldn't be doing. They used to tease me all the time. But through that, God carved into me the actual ability to be my own man and to not be bowing to the crowd and their opinion of me. I was just going to bow to Jesus because he knows more about me than anyone else. And if I live in his will, I'm going to live a life that actually has an impact. I'm going to model priorities to every single part of my life. And so this idea of drunkenness is a big deal in your chapter and in college chapter. And here's why. When you get to college, you're going to see people looking forward to, I can't wait to get plastered or get drunk or get high this weekend. Here's what they just told me. I'm excited to get away from myself. That's what they just told me. I can't wait to get to the weekend that I can forget who I am. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And this is a true story. This happened today. I got an email from someone I've known who said, Case, could you give me counsel on this? Here's what happened. This person was doing some stuff. They decided to get drunk. They went to the city. They got even more drunk. And then they basically sexually abused someone. That person's now looking at 25 years of prison from one night. One night. If he had lived his priorities, maybe his options would be greater. But now this guy's got to make a phone call to his parents and say, Mom, Dad, um, yeah, I wasn't really making some wise choices. And turns out I could get sentenced to 25 years. I'll see you when I'm 45. If you think priorities don't matter, you're clueless. You become a product of your choices. You know what your choices are? Your targets of what you want to be and what you choose to do. This is why this priority topic is so critical. If you get it, you're going to be in a a sweet spot. If you don't, you're going to be in a frustrating spot. So here's some things that cause us to have um, difficulties, the negative P's of priorities. One is procrastination. People will procrastinate a lot. They're like, well, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. One of the ways that people get around to certain things is they get around to handling money more wisely when they get older. Well, the longer you wait on that, the more dangerous it becomes. Same with your health and a bunch of other stuff. So procrastination and the key things are important. Number two, the pain of change. One of the reasons people don't pursue priorities and trying to make the things, the the B list, a reality is it's painful to change. You're acknowledging I'm not good in this area but I want to become better. One of the things that makes athletes really good is they recognize their strengths and their weaknesses and they get better in those weaknesses. They make the changes. Same thing academically, same thing musically. Otherwise, if you only know these chords, you can only play these songs. You can't change, okay? So the reality of of the pain of change is huge. And then this is, in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons that people don't live their priorities. They're people pleasers. You're constantly in a position of being paralyzed by the opinions of other people which is one of the reasons people get drunk, which is one of the reasons that people do things that they shouldn't be doing with their life, their body. And then they wonder why their life is in such pain and such disarray. It's because you're not living the priorities that God has for you. And so when you look at the core of all of this stuff, I'm hopeful that you're going to be excited about the reality of what you could become if you actually say, God, could you teach me? I want to live the priorities that you have for me. I need your help. I need his help. So do you. And so when you get to this next part, you're going to see that there's going to be decisions, okay? And here's one of the things, and I'm going to get more practical with um, some of the stuff that's in the rest of the part of your handout. Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. So you have to be able to live with the no's. Every single day, if you don't know what your priorities are, you're going to say, well, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. And all of a sudden you look at your calendar and you're like, oh dear God, I'm in massive trouble. I can't do all this. But if you recognize your priorities... And you say yes to the right thing so that the inner circle of your life, okay, is the happiest circle. If you upset the outside circles, it's okay. The inside circles you don't want to upset. How do I try to model that in my life? I try to model it that if any, if my wife is ever in the room and she has a question, everyone else will wait. She's first. She shares me with you. It ain't the other way around. She's in the inner circle, okay? I make, she's a priority. I said I do to her, 
and through saying I do to her, she makes my life very different in decision making. And so when you make the decision to do things in your school, do things in your future college chapter, you're going to say yes and no to stuff. Be able to live with the no's. Because if you can live with the no's, you made a really good yes decision. Okay? And you're going to have to model that in terms of this particular measurement. Here's the positive side. One is be prayerful. Be very prayerful. Nothing will change your ability to understand priorities like prayer. There's many, on Wednesday mornings, I spend time in my quiet time praying for tonight, praying for you, praying that somehow God will help you understand how much he loves you and how much he wants to live through you and the gifts he's given you to glorify his name and to make your life abundantly fruitful. Who doesn't want to be fruitful? And so when you and I get to that sense of saying, God, I need help, and you pray, you really pray, this is one of the the key things that you can do. You take a blank sheet of paper or a memo pad. A memo pad can be one of your best friends. And a pen, and you get on your knees at the foot of your bed or someplace comfortable in your room. You say, you know what, for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, I'm just going to try and close off the world, and I'm going to put some worship music, and I'm just going to pray and say, God, could you help me fill this page with things that you think are important for me? And watch and see what he does. It might not happen the first time. It might not happen the second, but there will be one of your quiet times. I guarantee you, because he's done it for me countless times, that all of a sudden you can't write fast enough. Because when I became your youth pastor, long before you had any clue I'd become your youth pastor, it's exactly what happened. Pastor Chip told the story of something and we had the uh, youth pastor resign. And all of a sudden I got home and for some reason I prayed. And as I'm praying, I filled one page. I filled a second page. I filled a third page. I filled a fourth page. I could not stop writing about all the stuff we could maybe do to reach teenagers with the love of Christ. And I called Pastor Chip at 10 o'clock at night that night and said, Chip, um, Can we talk on Monday? I am scared to death, but I might want to put my name in the list of being the next youth pastor of Spring Creek Church. When you pray, God says, I have a plan for you. Just write it down. And when you write it down, it'll light a fire in you in a way that you can't understand. This next one, purposeful. When you pray, he's going to give you the right purpose to pursue. You're not going to waste your time. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor in vain. I don't know about you, but I'm way too busy to labor in vain. I hate doing projects that don't matter. I hate studying for a test that doesn't actually get a grade. Doing all the different stuff that you and I do, you want to make sure that you're doing the stuff that God says, yes, that's what I designed you to do. And do that to the glory of God in the best way that you can. This last one is passionate. When you're prayerful and you become purposeful, guess what happens? Your life starts to have a passion. And you know what that passion creates? A presence. You're a person who's actually living out your priorities in such a way that people see that person has a plan. That person is living their priorities. And when you play that out, not just in a year, you do it five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years out, you're going to think me and my, you and your peers are going to be the same. No, you're not. You're not even close. Because if you have a farmer who's an investor and you have a farmer who's a sleeper, you look at their two farms 10 years out, five years out, even, even a year out, one year out, five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out, those farms look completely different. And guess what? You can't catch up to the investment farmer. You can't. Because that investment farmer is going to keep making more investments and you're going to play catch up the rest of your life. All because you just wanted to play. You didn't want to work on your priorities. You just wanted to play. And so when you and I have the courage to do this stuff, here's what I want you to understand. Look at the bottom of your sheet. I'm not going to go through this in detail because I've got other stuff I want to go through before we pray. Spiritual fitness, organizational fitness, and and professional fitness. I want to encourage you. There's 10 key areas, 10 areas that I have been doing goals for years. Okay. And as I've told you, it all goes in this binder. I have been doing the priority living for literally probably three decades. Okay. And so as you go through some of this, I have in this particular binder that I'm going to teach some of you who have an interest because we're going to do a special elective. These are my goals for 2020. In these 10 areas, it's specific and it's measurable. It's exactly what I told you to do on this page. So I'm not talking about my priorities. These are, I want to be these things. 
And you know what it is? By wanting to be these things, it's impacting my do list. It's impacting my time, okay? Which is why when I go to my main page in this part of the binder, which I've given you a form of, this is how I strategize how I live out those goals and use my Monday, my Tuesday, my Wednesday, or things from the previous week, I become intentional. So what I've given you on your handout is a, is a sample of what that could be for you. You've got this particular sheet, and then you've got another sheet that relates to daily, weekly, and monthly goals. So here's what you can do. You can basically say, if I'm gonna do some priorities, some key priorities in my life, you can basically say over here in life fitness, spiritual, you can put spiritual there, and you could just put a plus for every day that you actually do quiet time. I have an area for physical fitness in my binder here. Every day that I go and work out this, uh, this afternoon or late in the afternoon on a Wednesday just to clear my head before you guys all come in and stuff, usually it's like a 12-hour day for me, um, I go swim for a little bit. So I went and swam 50 lengths today. Went there, back, there, back, there, all this kind of stuff. And it was my workout. It's part of my fit fitness, okay? So I put a plus. I do these different things to say if these are a priority for me to be healthy, I have to put it into action in my life, okay? I have the same thing for financial and all that kind of stuff. And so here's what ends up happening. If you look at your week, Monday, Tuesday, all the way through Sunday, and you strategize, some of you are really good at this already, but if you add this layer to it, it'll make you even more intentional. Your GPA will go up, your intentionality and your priorities will go better, and in the process, you'll have a really strong school year. And then you'll have another strong school semester. And then guess what happens? You have options. You have options for employment. You have options for dating. You have options for your future courtship and marriage. Because no spouse is looking for a lazy spouse. No spouse is looking for someone who has no priorities. Because if you are, I'm really hurting for you. Your life's going to be a disaster. It's predictable. I've done my share of marriage counseling and family counseling. It will be a disaster. But you know what's fun to be with? People who live the priorities that God says, I've gifted you in this way. I've gifted you in this way. Those two come together as one. They're married and they develop those gifts to the glory of God and they keep living their priorities that God's laid on their heart to pursue. And guess what? Their presence as individuals, their presence as a couple, their presence as a family starts impacting other people all because they live a life that has intentionality. And if you do that and you kind of strategize these different things, I will tell you, it's a game changer. Your life will go from just surviving to thriving. And when that happens, I'm, I promise you, you will come back and you will talk to your D group leaders that help train you in this. And maybe you'll come back and say hi to me, you know, five, 10 years out, 20 years off, I'm still here. Who knows? I'd be in a walker or something. But nonetheless, okay, you might say, you know what? Hey, Pastor Case, thanks for telling me that. Thanks for giving me the 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 tools to actually put intentionality to my life. Because if you try, and this is, if you try between you reading this book and you applying the stuff on Make Today Count, you consistently do it, it will change your future. Here's how I know. If you want to come up, you can come and see these later. This was part of the middle school talk. You guys don't need it because you're in high school already. But I basically said to the students, if you want a letter jacket, you need to be training in middle school. This was my letter jacket in high school. This was my wife's letter jacket in high school. She went to Central. Yeah, hoo hoo, she's out here somewhere. Um, she had nine letters in high school. She was an amazing athlete and still is, okay? You don't just, they don't just hand you a letter jacket because you want to play a sport. We trained in such a way that eventually, this was my letter sweater for Marquette University when I started playing for Marquette. But then I kind of had some difficult things happen to me politically that was really tough. This became my letter jacket at the University of Wisconsin. And by the grace of God, um, this was my jersey. They gave me my jersey at the end. Um, my senior year, we were blessed to uh, be in the top 10 in the nation. And God blessed me to score a hat trick in the final, uh, one of the final games in the Sweet 16 type thing around the time we were in the tournament for NCAA. And uh, it allowed me to get just beyond this other guy and I was the leading scorer of the team by the grace of God. God helped me score goals that I couldn't do again if he let me try a hundred times, but he let me score the one time I needed it. And so in the process of training, 
I got really good at all these things that helped me understand the importance of prioritizing my time. And out of that came this. We used to do, uh, we still do upward soccer here. But at one point when we did the upward soccer in the first part of uh, when it was developed, it was broken significantly to the extent that Steve Schaefer and I who were designing it, we went to the conference to hear how they wanted to do it. I kept leaning over to Steve. Steve, we're not doing that. Steve, we're not doing that. Steve, we're not doing that. He's like, what are we doing? I said, probably nothing. We're just going to have a soccer ball. And so we changed all this stuff. And what ended up happening is by the grace of God, the stuff I did with soccer and my A license for coaching, I ended up rewriting the soccer curriculum that now goes to churches um, all over the United States and in South America and in parts of Africa, okay? All because I had to prioritize a part of soccer. And then at the end of the day, the jackets I'm most proud of, this was the first one that we had for a mission trip. And this is the one that we give uh, when we go on mission trips, international mission trips, so that you have a good warm jacket like in Ecuador or Scotland, places that we've been. Um, these are the jackets I'm actually most proud of because these jackets actually mean change lives. I scored a lot of goals and it was really fun and it impacted our national ranking and all that and that's cool. But when you go on a mission trip to tell people about the love of Jesus because he's priority one and you change a life for eternity or you change a student or you change a marriage that then changes for a long time and the process of that, it's a real blessing. And the last mission trip we went on, um, I was in Scotland and I happened to be on my 50th birthday and they gave me a jersey because I'm ancient, and uh, they gave me this jersey. It says Seymour on the back, and it's 50, and the guy came in with a kilt, no joke, a kilt, and played bagpipes um, on a birthday. And uh, I was kind of embarrassed, and then they gave me haggis, one of the worst foods you've ever seen in your life. It's like a liver. I don't even want to get into it, but it was disgusting. And to be polite, I took a sample, but then I gave it to someone else and shared, okay? <laughs> so, so the reality of life is this, okay? Because I want to wrap up before we um, go to the worship set. This handout is given to you because I want to set you up to win. I'm not here to give you busy work. I'm here to set you up to win, okay? The additional sheets that some of you picked up, but we ran out, I, I took some copies of it uh, so you can take it as you leave. It's basically a time sheet from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. I get up typically at about five o'clock in the morning and most days end quite a bit later. I strategically block out my time and because I tell time where to go, it impacts how I live my life and it impacts how my family um, and I experience life. And so when you and I get to the core of stuff, having a binder, having a plan is a, is a game changer. So you don't need something this thick. For those of you who really want to learn, we're going to do an elective eventually, I'm going to teach you. But you can start with a notebook and you can, or a, or a notebook, or you can start with a simple folder. Keep these sheets in there and start being strategic, specifically with measurable goals that you want to do in the month of October, November, December, all of this stuff. And see what God does by helping you learn priorities by the end of this year. So that at the end of this year, which is a crazy year, you come out stronger and looking forward to 2021 as most of us are just write off 2020 and let's look forward to 2021 because I pray for you as we close that I get to see you five, 10 years from now and you have a presence about you because you're living God's plan for you. That's my prayer for you. I want you to know what God's priorities are for you because if you live that, you're going to live a life that makes a difference and that's what matters. Those letter jackets, they're cool, they're fun, but the mission jackets, they're my favorites because I get to travel with you and go serve people in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a cool way to live. Let's pray. Father, help us to live the priorities that you've laid on our hearts to pursue. You've gifted and talented us in different ways in this room. Everybody in this room has different talents. So Father, help us to recognize those talents and those skills. Help us to prioritize our time so that we do our best to say yes to the right things and no to the right things. And help us, Father, to know that you love us and that you want us to live a life that will honor your word and show the world that we love you. Father, if there are people here who have not really trusted Jesus to be their savior, I pray that you'd help them to read the gospel of John. I pray that you'd help them to see that we are all are sinners in need of a savior. And there's nothing special about me. I just acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of a savior and you changed my life. And because of it, you're priority one. There is no higher than you. And you've taught me and you've blessed me to marry a woman that I am blessed to spend my days with. And because of it, my family's blessed. The ministry's blessed. And I'm blessed to actually do a ministry that I love to do. 
And so, Father, I pray that you'd help these students and these leaders get these three questions right. Who do you say that I am? Who will you say I do to? And what will you pursue, a calling or career? How will you invest your time? Help us, Lord, to prioritize our time because we want to have a presence that communicates to the world that we worship you, we serve you, and we want to glorify our King. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Enjoy leading worship with Jamie and the team.